Welcome to Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. Life in Accounting is the podcast for everyday heroes like you working in the accounting profession. Are you ready to hear from accounting influencers, thought leaders, visionaries, and other professionals leading change in the accounting world? Then stay tuned for Mark Goldman, a CPA, the owner of Where Accountants Go, and your host. Welcome to Life in Accounting. That curiosity or that love of learning has probably done more for me in my career than probably any other single thing. Well, hello, everyone. This is Mark Goldman, a CPA and your host for Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. That was just one of the insights that you'll hear on my interview with Mark Rich in this episode. Mark is the Director of Investments for the Kimball Art Foundation up in Fort Worth. In addition, he's dedicated a lot of time to working with the Fort Worth chapter and TSCPA itself on some demographic analysis and volunteer work at the community college level and the four-year university level, helping educate students on all the opportunities that exist for them in the accounting profession. If you're intrigued at all by where the profession is going and what the demographics look like and the future opportunities that are going to exist for accountants and CPAs, you're really going to enjoy this episode. So without further ado, here we go. Yeah, I'm glad to glad to do this. Wonderful. Well, I've had you on my radar to interview for a little while, actually, just to sort of catch up the listening audience. I, I first spoke with Mark earlier this year when he was working on an analysis for demographics of the CPA profession, purely on a voluntary basis, I may add. <laughs> Well, I noticed online that since moving on from EY, your your daytime job is is not quite a typical controller or CFO role. And so I thought in addition to talking sort of about the demographics and and the service aspect, I'd like to talk a little bit about your role now and and how you got there, because I think that'll be really interesting. Um, So if you don't mind, tell us a little bit about your current role and what you do exactly and, and how you worked your way into this path. Sure. Well, let let me start at the beginning just to give a little more sense of how I got where I was. We'll save the suspense for what I do now and reveal that later. But going all the way back to college, I had always kind of thought I wanted to do something in business. Always thought I had some skill set that worked well for that. And within my family, everyone that I knew was a CPA, quite literally. Started at my grandfather is a CPA, and he had three sons and one daughter. All three sons are CPAs. And so just by being at family gatherings, I got to see the different type of careers, the different type of work that people who had a CPA license could do, that they were able to go out and the dynamic work that they were able to do. Each one of the CPAs in the family, they all took a slightly different career path. No one really has the same career. No one has the same line of work, but they all have the common CPA. And so I kind of thought going into college that that would be something that would be really nice to go in, get an accounting degree. I ended up adding finance. I have an accounting and finance degree and be able to kind of with that degree, go and take my career as I saw within my own family to basically anywhere I wanted to go. So coming out of college, got the Master's of Accountancy and started at Ernst & Young, now EY, and went into public company audits. Uh, While I was at Ernst & Young, I uh, started out doing real estate audits and before transitioning to oil and gas clients primarily. And I actually spent about three and a half years on oil and gas clients and was able to really get some deep industry knowledge within the space. At the time, I had been at Ernst & Young for about five years, or a little under five years. Ernst & Young asked me to move to a different city for a different opportunity with a different client, which I was more than happy to accept. But before I moved, I wanted to really think about 
what I was going to do with my career. And I thought that the best answer might be to at least check and see if my network within Fort Worth had any connections that I could find a job and say where I had been. I'm in Fort Worth, Texas, by the way. And so I started looking for different opportunities. I really thought that my time spent in oil and gas, auditing oil and gas companies, would make me very valuable for oil and gas companies in the area. And so I started looking for these jobs. But at the same time, I I knew what I wanted from a job. And so I would get different offers and different opportunities for jobs, but none of them just felt right. I ended up actually turning down a couple of job offers because I didn't feel like the job was what I was really looking for from a career perspective. Towards the uh, time that I was actually supposed to relocate, uh, I was getting closer to that time. I almost decided, well, the best answer is just to go ahead and relocate. And that's what I had been planning to do all along unless I found a, a job that I really wanted to get involved in. And before I did actually relocate. I did come across an opportunity at the Kimball Art Foundation. It's a nonprofit private foundation that's here in Fort Worth, Texas. And after my initial call with the Kimball Art Foundation, I really kind of thought, you know, I don't know if I want to work in a nonprofit this early in my career, maybe somewhere down the line, a nonprofit makes sense. And that would be an opportunity that I would really look into. But I decided to go ahead and and go in and interview. And after talking to the foundation, I I figured out that the opportunity was actually much more dynamic than I had given it credit just on the initial look. And after interviewing, I decided that that was actually a great opportunity and something that I really wanted to look into. I was fortunate enough to be offered the position. And, And when I was hired, I was initially hired as the controller slash investment manager. And my job was kind of envisioned to be about 50% accounting work, taking care of closing the monthly books and reviewing financial statements and preparing financial statements, and about 50% working on the investment portfolio. As the foundation was created, it was endowed with money from the Kimballs, and that money has been invested to help support and operate the Kimball Art Museum that's a world-renowned museum located here in Fort Worth, Texas. And so when I initially started, the thought was about 50-50 accounting and finance, which I thought was a really dynamic opportunity. After I started at the foundation, it became clear that I was doing more and more work with the investments. Uh, Shortly after starting at the foundation, I began the Chartered Financial Analyst program, which is basically the uh, credentialing body for finance professionals, more so on the institutional finance professionals, but kind of becoming the gold standard for finance professionals. And I began the certification process there. After about two years, I completed the process. It's a series of three tests over, spread out over different time periods. After completing the CFA, by that time in my job in the actual position, I was doing significantly more work with the investments. And at that time, my job title actually shifted to director of investments. And now I still spend about 20 to 30% of my time with the accounting. I'm still in charge of putting out annual financial statements, still in charge of reviewing monthly financials, and any accounting work that needs to be done usually comes across my desk. But A lot of my time is spent managing the endowment portfolio and evaluating investment opportunities and working with our board to evaluate opportunities for the future. So it is quite a bit of a different role than what most accountants probably are looking for. And to be quite honest, I I wasn't looking for an opportunity like that in finance, and it kind of found me. One of the opportunities, I always joke about how I couldn't have planned the career I had. If I was planning it out, I I wouldn't have thought through it this well. But one of the opportunities that really matched up with my experience at Ernst & Young relative to the Kimball Art Foundation was my experience in oil and gas. The Kimball Art Foundation has significant holdings in oil and gas properties across the United States. And so my expertise in oil and gas was actually quite a benefit to the Kimball Art Foundation and made the experience that I had even more valuable than I would have ever thought for a nonprofit organization.
So that gives a little flavor of kind of my career path and a little bit of what I do here at the Kimball Art Foundation. It sounds like there may be a good networking lesson in here somewhere. How how did you come across the opportunity at Kimball, or how did it find you? Yeah, so it was an actual networking example. I passed out my resume to several people that I knew, and through people that I knew, they passed it on to other people that they knew, and uh, they ended up passing it to my boss who hired me. The thing that was a little funny about it to me was that I actually knew the daughter of the person who passed my resume on to my boss. I had worked with them at Ernst & Young. However, I didn't think about getting the resume to her. I didn't realize that that was a networking point that I could have gone through directly and used myself directly. It was one of those where it just it got around to the right people and the right people passed it along and it ended up working out really well. So never discount the value of the network and what that network can do. Even if I think I was even a couple of steps removed from my resume from the person who actually passed, passed my resume along. Uh, it was a couple of steps after I had passed it to someone. So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It sounded like there was, there was a good lesson in there. You're right. Never discount the value of a network. Definitely. So what do you like best about what you do now? Sounds like you enjoy the investment side. Yeah. So what's really interesting, accounting is great. And I I always enjoy the accounting and and a lot of what I actually think a lot of skills that I learned in public accounting are actually very transferable to the investment space, as you can imagine. But I do enjoy the investment opportunities, the ability to look at opportunities and to evaluate those opportunities and to decide, is this an opportunity that is a good fit for the Kimball? For instance, whenever I'm interviewing a manager, whenever they come through the office to say, hey, we have this investment thesis, we think that you should look at it, you should evaluate. One of the skills I think I learned in public accounting as an auditor that is a skill that should not be missed or uh, not thought of as a skill is the ability to ask questions. In uh, public accounting as an auditor, that's really what uh, you're doing a lot of is going in, asking question, letting the person talk, trying to figure out if that answer is correct, or then saying, well, how can I verify the information that they've presented to me? And how does that match with what I can see through other evidence? And being able to tie all that together is actually part of the investment skill as well. Uh, It allows me to interview managers to understand their actual philosophy, to understand why they have a differentiated approach, why their approach is different than someone else's, and why that approach should work in the future. And these are all skills that I directly attribute to my time in public accounting as an auditor. And so I do think that even the accounting work that I did in public accounting still plays a significant role in what I do in the investments. But honestly, the investment part is a little more dynamic than the accounting work that I do as well. Okay. Okay. Well, moving to the, the demographic study that, that you were involved in, I guess, how did, how did that come up? How did you end up doing that service for TSCPA? And, and what, were your, what were your findings? What are your thoughts on those findings? Where would you like to start? Let me start at the beginning of the story for me. And I know that I was in contact with you, call it in the seventh or eighth inning of this part of the story. So I'm going to go back all the way to the start of it and convey maybe how this study even came about. Several years ago, in 2012 or so, I began working more intensely with the Fort Worth chapter of the Texas Society of CPAs. And basically, as a group, we were trying to figure out some answers to questions. I specifically was working on a a subcommittee that we called the Accounting Career Education. And one of the roles of the accounting career education was to go and tell typically students about careers in public accounting. Historically, the committee had focused on high school students. And there was this shift in the year that I joined that committee where we started saying, is there a place that we can spend our effort that maybe will have a higher rate of return? And so 
we began looking at different uh, information. One of the studies that came up was from the AICPA, the American Institute of CPAs, and they came out with a study that said a lot of students were starting their advanced degrees, their college degrees in community colleges or junior colleges. And so within that committee, we decided to make an effort and a push to take the message of becoming a CPA and what that career would look like to students at the community colleges here in Fort Worth. And so we began developing a program that we could take to students. We began looking for people within the community colleges who could be champions to invite us into the community college to present our material. And for me, this was really driven out of a passion. As, as I mentioned early on, my reason for choosing accounting as a career, as a, even just as a major, was really driven by the fact that I had people in my life that I could look at and see what a career in accounting meant for them and what a career in accounting was able to do for them across their career. And so I had this very rich picture of what being a CPA was, but I, I recognized that I was, I was probably a minority. I was probably the rare example of people who actually had that in their lives and they could see what that career would look like. And so it was a passion of mine to get out to tell other students who were thinking, you know, I, I think I want to do something with business, but I don't know what I want to do. To be able to put professionals in front of them to say, look, here are the different types of careers that professionals who pursue accounting, here are the different types of careers that they can have. One of those things that they can pursue is being licensed to be a CPA. So they can practice accounting with the, the backing of a regulated license. And so we would go into the junior colleges, the community colleges, with this message. Well, we, uh, <laughs> we were dreaming big. We, had, we set up a goal that in three years, three or five years, I forget what the number was, but that we wanted to reach. We were in a planning session, and I think I said something like, I want to do 2,500 students. I want to reach 2,500 students, when I think the previous year we had reached like 120 or something like that. And so it was kind of a, I think I made some comment like, what's the point of having a, a goal if it's not a lofty goal? And I didn't think they were going to take me seriously on putting the goal down. And they put the goal down that we were going to go out and reach all these students. And then I was like, okay, I guess we've got to go figure out how to do this. And so while we were talking, we were doing the program with the junior colleges and we were starting to get traction there. We were starting to find people within the junior colleges and community colleges who were inviting us into their classroom to present to students. We were being intentional about finding professional CPAs who were dynamic and who could paint a picture of what a career would look like. Uh, and oftentimes, we were also trying to find younger CPAs who could resonate perhaps a little more with the students, that they could see this is what a career looks like even after five to 10 years in a career. And so we also then started saying, well, how are, how are we going to reach 2,500 students? We've got to expand this a little bit. And so our next step that we went to was we started saying, what about a four-year college? Where could we talk to students about what a career in accounting looks like within the four-year colleges? And we reached out to one of the universities here in the area, the University of Texas at Arlington, and we had a champion within the university who gave us time in classroom, who said, yes, we will carve off time in the classrooms if you guys will send us professionals to speak about careers in accounting. And we were able to get access to that financial accounting class, the very first one that all business students have to take. We were able to get access to go in and present to the students what careers in accounting looked like, and even specifically why students should consider becoming licensed as a CPA. And so uh, our message was twofold. Accounting is more than just a class that you take to satisfy a requirement for a business degree. Accounting can be a career. And we hoped by showing examples of this with professionals that students would look more seriously at careers in accounting. We ended up reaching our goal. It was, it was actually quite remarkable 
and the program is still going strong. We continue to be invited out to the universities and the junior colleges to present the message about becoming a CPA, about becoming an accountant. And we believe that that's one of the ways that we can continue to have a healthy profession. So from that work, I was working with the Fort Worth chapter, and the question kept coming up within our chapter was, where is the next generation of accountants? And we were, we were struggling with the fact that when we would go to events, when we would go and gather as CPAs in the area, we would see a lot of people who were getting closer and closer to retirement, but we weren't seeing people within the profession who were young and who were coming into the profession as much. And so what we wanted to do was we wanted, being accountants, we wanted to put some numbers, some data to that feeling that we were having. And so we were also doing it from a planning perspective, a long-term viability of the organization. Does the organization have enough members as a Texas Society of CPAs or specifically the Fort Worth chapter of CPAs, do we have enough members to continue to offer the services that we have offered in the past? And so I began obtaining demographic data on our population of CPAs who are members of our society here in Fort Worth. And it was a really interesting study. It was information that we think has kind of like anecdotally been known. We always kind of knew. But once you put graphs on paper and once you kind of showed what that looked like over time and how, the, how this has changed, let's say, over the last 10 or 15 years, it was a very interesting perspective that we had. And we still have a lot of questions that we're trying to answer on this. We've even gone to the State Board of Public Accountancy, the body that licenses CPAs, and we've tried to get some additional information from them on who they're licensing and how many people are being licensed each year. And we continue to look for some more information to help us understand this trend. But the overall trend that we're feeling is that there are a lot more CPAs who are closer to retirement than CPAs who are coming into the profession. And so anyone who is under 35 should just feel that there is a great number of opportunities opening up for them in the space of public accounting, in uh, careers in accounting, because what the data is telling us is that there's a large group of people who are on the cusp of retiring. Nowadays, more and more students are looking at so many more options that are available for careers, whether that's information technology is one that's coming on strong, sciences, et cetera, that the thought is is that perhaps the public accounting is not doing a good enough job of explaining what role we play within the business world, what role we play within just the public comfort with information and with data and with ideas that are being invested on by, for instance, me and my investment role. You know, I need to have good data from people so I can make good investment decisions. And accountants are a big piece of that. And I think that some students are overlooking the value of a career in accounting right now because there are a lot of other opportunities that are available for them. And kind of my push on the demographic study was to say, we as CPAs, as current CPAs, need to be continually evaluating how we get CPAs into the profession, how we get accountants into the profession, or we're going to come to a time here soon where we have so many people retiring and we haven't gotten new people, new students to consider careers in accounting that we're going to be looking at a shortage for the workforce, which will have dramatic uh, changes in how accounting is done or how accounting is completed. And then also the value of accountants who do have credentials, who do have degrees, who have the ability to apply critical thinking. And so that was the entire push for the demographic study from my perspective. Uh, It also became a big deal for evaluating how this would impact the uh, society of CPAs, how this would affect kind of the larger community as a whole, and, and what opportunities are there that we have today to take action to hopefully make a change in how that trend looks. Right now, the trend is saying that we're going to be smaller as a group of CPAs over the next several years. And uh, at some point, we'll level out. And we're hoping that we don't have to simply level out. Maybe we can increase a little bit. And the very best would be to continue to increase the number of people who are coming into accounting professions. I'm curious what your thoughts are, the 
primary reason or if there really is a primary reason, because I've heard this approach from several different angles. First of all, that not enough people are pursuing accounting as a career. I've heard it approached or, or the possible cause being that people are pursuing accounting as a career, but not enough are going to pursue the CPA. And then I heard once, actually, at a small committee meeting, a TSCPA committee meeting, that part of the issue is just the the generational size difference or gap. So, in other words, if if the average age of passing the CPA exam is 29 or 30, well, your oldest millennials are only in their early 30s anyway. So maybe we just haven't seen that that large wave you know, come through the profession because Gen X was so much smaller. Do you have any thoughts on any of those? Yeah, you know, these are the these are the questions that we are continually seeking answers for. There's generally not an easy way of answering those questions, but I tend to generally agree. It seems as though there are, are people choosing accounting as a field of study. Those numbers have seemed to remain at best stable. There was an uptick a couple couple of years ago. Those numbers have remained stable or just a slight decline. But as far as people going and pursuing an advanced degree or even pursuing the CPA license, that is where I, I get the sense that we are having some drop off. And what I'm always telling students when I'm talking to them about careers in accounting, I love that there are people who want to choose a career in accounting. And I think that's a great career. I think that people can do a lot with that. But I also think, and I also believe that obtaining the CPA license allows students career flexibility down the road. Yes. For instance, when I was, so I interviewed coming out of public accounting, I interviewed across various industries. I I talked to a healthcare manufacturer. I talked to investment groups, both hedge funds and private equities. I talked to oil and gas companies about career opportunities, about jobs. Each time I interviewed, no one asked me how to do a debit and credit. (laughs) It was just, it was assumed I knew, (laughs) it was assumed I knew how to do the actual accounting work because I had the credentials, I had the CPA license after my name. No one had to ask me, are you familiar with this? Are you familiar with that, this or that accounting rule? They knew with the initial CPA after my name that I was going to be able to learn what I needed to in that area and be proficient in it. And so that allowed me to interview and to talk to different opportunities that would not have been available to talk to had I not had a CPA license. If I had just gone to public accounting and I had stayed in Ernst & Young, I didn't have to get my CPA license. At Ernst & Young, it wasn't required until you had been there over five years if you wanted to be promoted to a manager. And so I could have easily stayed there and never looked at getting the CPA license. And I could have had the same career within Ernst & Young, but my job prospects outside of Ernst & Young, I believe would have been limited. People would have maybe given me a a call back, or they may not have even taken an initial call and request for a job without the CPA license. Uh, It's hard to say for sure one way or the other. So there is that where students will choose accounting as a career or as a field of study, but yet they, they don't go all the way to getting the CPA. I actually know several people just within my own group of people that I know who have gone, they have fulfilled all the requirements to sit for the CPA exam. And in some cases, they've even taken one or two of the exams and they just stopped. And when they go to look for jobs or they say, Mark, do you have any job opportunities that you know of or are aware of? And I kind of, sometimes I'm just like, well, I I do know of something, but they're looking for someone who's a CPA and, and wrong or right, whether that's necessary or not. The the work is not public accounting. The work is not necessarily specific to having a license, but the people who are looking to hire see the value of the CPA license. They see the value of the CPA as a credential, and they want people who have that. And as less people take that opportunity or less people pursue that, and there's various reasons. We have the additional year of school, you know, it usually takes about five years now 
to get the required hours to sit for the CPA exam. There's the discipline of actually sitting for the CPA exam. It's not a test that the last time I checked with someone who had taken it more recently, they haven't changed it so much that apparently it's just a, uh, do you want to be a CPA? You just have to check yes or no. It takes some effort. It takes some work. And so that has the way of cutting people out who aren't either dedicated to the process or don't want to complete it. And and those things translate when people are looking for a job. So when they see the license, when they see the CPA behind your name, they can start attributing stuff to that person, wrongly or rightly. This person was dedicated to obtaining the license. This person is continuing to learn with the requirements for the CPE, for the continuing professional education, that they're continuing to be a lifetime learner. Whether that's absolutely true of that person or not, I'm not sure that having just having the CPA license means that or not, but those are things that are attributed to that person wrongly or rightly just because they have a license. And so I, I see, and I've always seen, again, as I mentioned, just throughout my family, the value of the CPA license was really the tool to be able to go and move and to take your career and to own your career yourself. Being an accountant you might sometimes be able to find an opportunity, but they weren't, you weren't going to be able to uh, drive that as often or as much sometimes as if you had the CPA license. All else being equal, if I'm interviewing someone with a CPA license and without a CPA license, I'm going to probably be looking at the person who has the CPA license to bring them into the role if all else was equal. And so it's kind of the question of, are they choosing to accounting and then not choosing the CPA license. Uh, And there are a lot of reasons for doing that. The other question you brought up was, have we not seen the wave of millennials, that there's this big group of millennials that are just waiting, they've just been hanging out, waiting for to join and become CPAs. And I think that there's some level that that could be true, that we haven't seen this large increase. However, I do also believe dramatically that there are a lot of opportunities for students today for strong careers in fields that weren't around 20 or 30 years ago where students would more typically have chosen accounting. For instance, I look at programming and coding and IT, and those are opportunities that some of the students who are choosing those right now may have historically chosen accounting because of the data intensity, because of the the numbers or the the affinity to numbers and just the, the way of thinking about problems. So accounting has more of a strong competitor for some of the natural talent that might have typically and historically chosen, even if the demographics are larger in the, millenn- in the millennial age, that they have more opportunities that are more varied and can provide strong careers in different fields other than accounting. So I think it's kind of a mix of all of that. And I should mention, I am myself a millennial. So I do see some of this in my generation where people that historically I would have thought they would have been a good good accountant, they have chosen some career in information technology. Nothing wrong with that. I do just think that that means there are more opportunities in accounting that are going unfulfilled and that will go unfulfilled in the future. Well, bringing that full circle then, you talked about the volunteer efforts you put in at the community college level and then at the the four-year university level as well to talk to students. If a chapter or or I guess any organization uh, is going to put in that type of effort to promote the accounting profession, what advice would you have for a committee doing that or what do you feel is the most important thing to focus on? Absolutely. That's a a great question because it's so nuanced. You really have to have buy-in from people in the society, from the organization to say, this is something that matters for the greater good of our community, of our CPA community. Because a lot of the students that we talk to, they may choose careers in accounting because we went and talked to them. They may choose to become CPAs but we generally don't have any statistics that say we talked to this person and now they've chosen to become, they weren't, they were going to choose some other major or some other degree and they chose instead to become CPAs. We're not going to get those success stories or at least we're not going to know about them. 
Also, when you talk to the larger public accounting firms or ones that have enough maybe resources to allocate some people to help in these efforts, they want to know that their people are helping them recruit directly for their firm or for their group. And so sometimes this nebulous thought of recruiting for just the industry as a whole or you know, advocating for the industry as a whole is lost on people. But yet, By advocating for the industry as a whole, they have to recognize that that will give them more opportunities and more people coming into the profession overall. And I think that's sometimes where it's tough. They have to think about it as a bigger picture in that it may not directly relate or tie to their firm, but by doing nothing, (laughs) that's that's not going to help out either. Uh, That's not going to change any tide. That's not going to change the trends that we're seeing with a a reduction in the number of people choosing CPA as a career. And so it is, it is a bit of a, of a nebulous question. People have to kind of step back and recognize as a whole that the profession would be better off, even if we don't directly benefit, you know, the only success story that we directly know about is a student who came up to us. We do a job shadowing day. Uh, We had historically done a job shadowing day in the Fort Worth area. And we had a student come from a four-year college, and they came and talked to us. And after the event, they talked to one of the team at the Fort Worth, Texas Society CPA chapter. And they told us that they had chosen to get their CPA because they heard someone come and speak at the community college. They went to the community college and got the requirements for the uh, lower level studies at the community college, and then they transferred to a four-year university. And because of a talk that they heard at the community college, they decided that they were going to do accounting as their career. We were able to find the actual person that had probably gone and spoken to that person because she was able to give us enough details about which time of year it was, where it was. And we were able to find the actual, this is the person who went and spoke to that person and actually give them the feedback to say, hey, you're speaking at this event helped impact the life of this person who chose accounting. And so, but that's, that was a complete anecdote. We didn't, you know, there's no study we have, there's no data that we have that says this work is going to produce results for the CPA society, for the CPA community. And so it is taking a lot of great people to say, I'm not sure what the actual results of this are going to be, but I think this is good work that needs to be done and them coming in and volunteering. And it's not me by any means. We have so many people who go out every semester out to the university and colleges and fill the speaker spots and talk to the students and give them their time that really we believe are making impacts. We just, we may not see it in the next few years, but hopefully later on, maybe we'll get some additional stories where students have told us or where they come up and tell us later on, I made this choice after I heard someone speak. And because of that, I became uh, an accountant. I became a CPA. And so, but it does take a a bigger picture and longer term view of the entire process, which is sometimes hard to, hard to do. That's where I was hoping the demographic study that I did would kind of show just simply the importance of this type of work that getting out and talking to students is the best opportunity we have to have a strong and healthy CPA profession in the state of Texas, at the very least. Yes, I totally agree with, with, well, with everything, but with one of the comments you made in particular, it's, it's the difference between making a short-term investment and a long-term investment in the career. And I, I think that that kind of effort can't be led by just one firm. It, it needs to be led by a group and therefore you know, TSCPA or, or a chapter thereof is, is really the only association or the most appropriate association to, to lead that kind of effort because you have to take a long-term view of, of the investments you're making. Yeah. yeah, definitely. Well, thank you. You've, you've given me a lot to think about, and I'm sure the listeners as well. Before we, we get to the final questions I have for every podcast guest, is there anything else you want to share about that activity or, or any other comments you have to wrap that up? No, I think that uh, I covered everything on it. Okay. If somebody wanted to get involved in that effort there in Fort Worth, I mean, who's the best person to contact there at the chapter? Yeah, so within Fort Worth, the Texas Society of CPAs, the Fort Worth chapter, 
we have committees and we are always willing and welcoming for people who want to be involved in that. For someone who's outside of Fort Worth, I would say that there's ample opportunities within, if you're in Texas, within your, your chapter to do this work. And even if you don't have a society that's vibrant in your area, even just going to a professor or a, un- a university or a junior college and as a professional wanting to talk to the students and saying, would I be able to come in to your class? Can you give me 10 or 15 minutes? The one that we do at the four-year college, we initially structured it to be a 10-minute presentation. I've probably gone out to the university to do this presentation, oh, probably seven or eight times by now. I've never given a 10-minute presentation because the professor is always more than happy to allow me to field any questions. I don't know if the students are, if there's a threat, if I'm not up there talking to them and if they're not asking questions that they have to go back to learning about depreciation usually. It seems like every time I'm there, they're learning depreciation, you know, double declining and straight line. And so I don't know if it's a threat of that they have to go back to actually learning uh, about this stuff, but the students are very engaged. They're always curious to know more about what a career in accounting looks like and and more about even just licenses. And again, I'm, I'm a little more unique. I get to go in with two, basically, credentials. I have a CPA, uh, but I'm also a CFA. And so being able just to talk to the the students about the importance of these licenses and certifications and what that means and how that can impact their career is even more of a strong point that I'm able to make when I'm talking to the students. And so, you know, if someone wants to get involved, if a society is not supporting it, I guarantee you there's some professor at a university who would be more than happy to bring you into their classroom uh, to talk to their students about a profession that they're passionate enough about that they are teaching 18, 19, and 20-year-olds about. And so usually there are ways to get involved and opportunities. And uh, hopefully this is something that for the CPA community is something that is a, a big benefit later on down the road. Yes, I'm sure sure it wouldn't be difficult to find a professor that's willing to give you a little time. That that makes a lot of sense. Well, the final questions I ask every guest, and and these get a little more personal. So first of all, what's been your proudest moment? You know, my proudest moment was probably back when my wife was pregnant with our first son. And I was able to say, I think I want to do something differently I want to have a career that allows me to be the father that I want to be, which sounds completely counterintuitive, but it kind of allowed me to step back and say, I have priorities. And then I was able to say, I want to line up my entire life with these priorities. I don't want to just do it part of the way. Just being able to actually say, these are my priorities. This is what's important to me. And then being able to act on that. I was probably the proudest that I've been of myself just for kind of saying that's what I wanted and that's what I then made decisions by and uh, decisions for. And so that'd be my proudest moment. Okay. And you said your first son. How many children do you have? Two children. One is a son who's six and a daughter who's four. And so I usually, so I joke, I, I've given my family tree on my family side with my grandfather's CPA, my dad and his two brothers are CPAs. I have a twin brother who's a CPA. And then on my wife's side, it gets just as bad. Her father, so my father-in-law, and his two brothers are all CPAs as well. And so if my kids become something other than a CPA, they are very strong and independent individuals and human beings, and they should be commended for that. But if they become CPAs, I think the family will be happy. Wow. I, I didn't know about the twin brother. and Oh my gosh, wife's family as well. Amazing. Wow. Yeah. So, uh, so there's definitely, there's definitely just a little pressure on them to look into uh, careers in accounting at the very least, I suspect. But like I said, if they choose something different, they're very strong and independent people and they should be uh, lauded for that. But if they choose accounting, no one's going to, no one's going to fault them. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, 
you definitely are the right person to be in charge of influencing people to go into the profession. <laughs> I, I will I will say I, I received a, an award for some of the work I did with the community college, et cetera, and it's about the only place where I can tell all that family tree and make a joke about my kids and how they better become CPAs, where it actually uh, is a really good laugh line. I think most other audiences, it would fall flat, but amongst a bunch of CPAs, <laughs> they thought that was hilarious, so... <laughs> Well, I'm sure you have a lot of people to choose from in this category, but who's been the biggest mentor for you in your career? So I, I really key in on two people. My father has been a big mentor for me in my life, uh, just the uh, character, the person that he is, plus also the professional that he is in his professional career has been a big mentor. Also, my current boss, Brenda Klein, has been a great mentor for me here at the Kimball Art Foundation. She's been just about the best boss that I could probably have and has so much wisdom. She's been at the foundation for over 20 years. And so her knowledge and background uh, and way of thinking has really been impactful in how I've kind of grown into my role here at the foundation and probably have so much, to, so much that I don't even recognize that I've picked up from her that will be with me for the rest of my life. So those would be the two people I'd pull out most quickly. Okay. Well, what's been the best advice you've ever received? You know, so this is a question that's always funny to me. It's probably like, well, whatever's going on in this day, that's the best advice. But the one that I always, or at least one of the ones I I always like, or at least I I like to think, maybe I like it because I feel like I'm taking the advice. I I don't know. Uh, Is that how advice works? You only like the advice that you actually want to implement. But um, (laughs) is always being a lifetime learner. That's the one that just, and whether it's a natural curiosity or just kind of wanting to know, well, why is that that way? That curiosity or that love of learning is probably done more for me in my career than probably any other single thing. I mean, part of the reason that we started going to the community college is because of the question of why are we not doing this? Is there anything that could point us in a different direction here? Like, and then going in and finding, oh, hey, look, the AICPA says, hey, there's a lot of people who are starting their careers or starting their university careers in junior colleges that is underserved from a career counseling perspective about accounting. And so these type of things and these curiosities and wanting to learn why something is probably driven a lot of what I do. I do it all the time with the investments where I allow myself to go down a little rabbit trail because I don't understand it or I don't know enough about it perhaps, but then going down that trail leads me to some other information that I wouldn't have figured out or identified otherwise. And so that's probably been the best advice I've uh, received is be a lifetime learner. And actually, let's say best advice that I've received and actually implemented. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm going to give you a few days, call you back, and then we can talk about the advice you haven't implemented that, you know, may have been a good idea. (laughs) No, no, that that would be the wrong one, Dad. No one needs to know that. Uh, <laughs> apparently, I don't think it's good enough to listen to. <laughs> well, that's perfect to end this on. The last question, the easiest one of all, hopefully, if somebody wants to get in touch with you and, and talk maybe about the analysis you worked on or volunteer efforts at the Fort Worth chapter there or your career and, and how you got to where you are today, what's the best way to reach you, Mark? You know, probably the easiest one that is out there is you can find me on LinkedIn under Mark Rich and Kimball Art Foundation and just send me a message and actually mention this podcast and I'll probably be more likely to reach back out. But uh, if you do have any questions, that's, you know, that's one of those where, you know, an email address doesn't ever change. It, It just comes to you and stuff. And so I give you an email address and it could change here down the road. And so probably best just to give some other format to reach out, but LinkedIn would probably work. So I'd be more than happy to answer any questions or to give any perspective that I can. I, I'm not sure what it's worth, but I'm more than happy to, to offer that. <laughs> well, LinkedIn's where I did my, my pre-podcast research, so I, I think that's a great suggestion. That'll work out perfectly. Well, thank you again, Mark. I really appreciate you taking the time to share with our listeners. I I think you've given us some good insight into not just your career, but really the profession overall. So this has been much more than I even realized when I scheduled this. So thank you very, very much. No, you're welcome. And hopefully it, it means something to someone else as well. 
Well, that was my interview with Mark Rich, a volunteer in the Fort Worth chapter of TSCPA. Mark went into quite a bit of detail about his own journey and and how that turned into a job that that he truly loves, as well as the the demographic study he's done for the the state chapter and some of the local chapters of TSCPA. And honestly, I'm not sure there's much more I can add to that other than to say, number one, thank you for the sacrifice of, of time and effort that you put into it. From the conversation, I can tell that that was a a long, very in-depth effort, and and I, as a CPA, appreciate you doing that, as well as your efforts at the local level on the Accounting Careers Education Committee. Thank you very much. Secondly, it just goes to show the plethora of opportunities that will continue to exist for accountants and CPAs in Texas and, and largely everywhere, I'm sure. I hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you haven't yet visited the Where Accountants Go Home website for our Life in Accounting podcast, please do so at www.whereaccountantsgo.com. On that website, you can find many resources, one of them being show notes for every single podcast episode we've done. So if you have an interest in doing any more research or being in contact with any of the guests that we've had, please visit the website at www.whereaccountantsgo.com. That's been another episode of Life in Accounting, the Where Accountants Go podcast. I hope you've enjoyed it. And as I always say, there's more to come.